Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this presentation, we'll tackle the pneumoconioses for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF of this presentation is available at the website. And as a periodic reminder, tutorial services are also available through the website. Before launching, I want to emphasize that questions on this topic are finite and predictable. As such, I view this topic as a gift, so don't be stubborn. Insofar as that name, pneumoconiosis, it used to make me nuts. I found it annoying until I realized that conus was Greek for dust. Then it made perfect sense, dust in the lungs. Now I love that word and will say it 500 times in this presentation. Here is the roadmap for our presentation. If you already understand the restricted pattern on pulmonary function testing, you can skip ahead. Also, for purposes of time management, I'll present the sample questions in a separate presentation. Let me remind you straight away that the pneumoconioses are classified as restrictive lung disorders with characteristic patterns noted on pulmonary function testing. As such, you should be familiar with the PFT characteristics of restriction covered in a separate video, including decreased lung volumes and capacities, and in particular, total lung capacity and vital capacity. Pictured are images of fibrotic lung disease. It is easy to envision volume loss. Insofar as airflow, the FEV1 is decreased, as is the force vital capacity. But as you need to be aware, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is preserved. A favorite derivative specifically asks why the ratio is preserved. Answer, radial traction on the airway. Collagen fibers in the fibrotic lung literally prevent the airway from collapsing. You should familiarize yourself with the idea of radial traction. The other key derivatives relate to the issues of compliance and elasticity. I won't beat it to death here, but compliance refers to the distensibility of tissue. The graphic reveals a balloon that has been blown up too many times. This balloon is described as being very distensible or compliant. In restrictive or fibrotic lung disease, the compliance or distensibility is reduced. You won't be blowing up the fibrotic lung too many times, that's for sure. On the flip side, elasticity or elastic recoil is described as increased. That is, the lung wants to snap back or recoil to its resting underinflated state. The increased elasticity is conceptually depicted by the rubber water bottle. It has poor distensibility, resisting inflation, and wanting to recoil to its uninflated state like the fibrotic lung. So to summarize, in restrictive disease, all parameters are decreased except the FEV1 to FVC ratio, which is normal, and the elasticity, which is described as increased. So with that information out of the way, let's dive in. Our focus will include coal, silica, and asbestos. Unlike the organic antigens associated with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the pneumoconioses develop as a result of inhaling inorganic dusts. As just alluded to, they are generally presented as interstitial lung disorders with a restrictive pattern owing to the development of fibrosis. Silicosis and asbestosis each have additional standout features and a unique set of complications. So how will we identify each of the disorders? Starting with coal workers' pneumoconiosis, guess which of the three occupations might be predisposing? I know this is stupid, but I love those pictures. So here's some headline news. Coal mining is associated with coal workers' disease. That was easy enough. Silica exposure is not quite as obvious. The principal occupations or industries include foundry work, sandblasting, mining, and granite workers. The occupations for silica is not usually a deal breaker given the other unique features that a silicosis vignette will include, but you should have passing familiarity. And finally, you should be familiar with the common sources of asbestos exposure, including shipbuilders, roofers, auto mechanics working on car brakes, and insulation workers. And just to keep it real, identifying the occupations or source of exposure doesn't get you across the finish line. This information just sets you up for the derivatives that follow, and the first set of these derivatives focuses on the pathology. So what do you need to know about coal workers' disease? Answer, not much. The major takeaways include the presence of anthrocotic pigment representing dust that is phagocytized by alveolar macrophages. These are appropriately enough called dust cells. The loosely related derivative focuses on particulate size that can successfully navigate down to the alveolar macrophage. Particles smaller than 5 microns tend to escape mucociliary transport and are ingested by the tissue macrophage. Moving on to silica, the key pathologic descriptor is collagen, as in dense collagenous nodules. 
This is a very fibrotic disorder, and those fibrotic nodules may variably be described by acellular fibrosis. You may see the silica particles described as birefringent. This is not particularly important. I only mention it so you won't be thrown off by the description. And finally, the characteristic pathologic finding for asbestos is the so-called asbestos body. Nothing crazy here, but they go a little nuts on the fiber description, being noted as crocodolite or amphibile fibers, with their darkened appearance representing iron and protein deposition derived from phagocyte ferritin. So these are asbestos bodies in distinction to ferruginous bodies, which are also encrusted with ferroproteins, but derived from different mineral fibers. Not a major issue, but you should be aware. Before proceeding, let's take a moment to refresh our understanding of what is going on here. In all instances, the macrophage is ingesting particulate matter. With all three disorders, albeit to a different extent and with different cytokine mediators, the tissue macrophage is stimulating fibroblasts and ultimately collagen synthesis. Let's keep this in mind when viewing the radiographs in the next set of slides. There is no expectation that you will review an x-ray in isolation and make a diagnosis. So let's start again with the coal worker. Coal worker pneumoconiosis is characterized by the presence of simple fibrosis. As just mentioned, the ingested coal particles stimulate macrophages to secrete cytokines, resulting in collagen deposition. When this process is severe, the result is massive fibrosis with a nodular appearance and may be referred to as black lung disease. Just as an FYI, no one looks at a film of fibrosis and say, hey, this is a coal worker's disease. You need the right clinical setting. The silicosis story is quite different. There are a unique combination of findings that are highly suggestive, and they expect you to have some familiarity with these. The first noteworthy feature is lymph node calcification, described also by eggshell calcification. For ease of recall, you just need to appreciate this finding as representing dystrophic calcification. So a vignette could easily include a radiograph demonstrating lymph node calcification in a patient working in the mining industry, followed by a question such as choose the most likely cause or pathologic description. And before leaving these images, take in the dense fibrotic nodules characteristic of silicosis. The x-ray simply reflects the pathology. Finally, the radiograph in asbestosis. Pictured are the characteristic pleural plaques or calcifications. These are specific markers of asbestos-related lung disease, but they themselves carry no specific risk of neoplasm or mesothelioma. They are simply markers of asbestos exposure. And as an FYI, it is worth emphasizing what you don't see, that being nodules. Both coal and silica may present with nodular disease. Asbestos does not. This is probably irrelevant, but it kicks around in the Q-banks. So the occupations, pathology, and radiographs are typically just the setup for that which follows, which are a finite and predictable set of complications. Alternatively, they can present a complication and ask you to backfill the pathology or underlying cause. To me, this is the key section in defeating the forces of evil. So here goes. Starting with coal, the complications are nil. No real action. Nodularity and fibrosis. I'll toss in the low yield definition of Kaplan syndrome that you might see in the QBanks or review manuals. To me, it's stupid, but it is simply defined as a pulmonary nodular disorder occurring in minors with rheumatoid arthritis. It's nutty, but Dr. Kaplan was a heavy in the field of occupational lung injury. Moving on to silicosis, these nuggets of information are worth holding on to. The patient with silicosis is predisposed to tuberculosis. There is a questionable association with malignancy, but anything that is questionable is not fodder for the NBME, so no worries here. Insofar as tuberculosis, they are fond of the pathologic basis, and it appears related to macrophage dysfunction. The macrophage that is busy consuming silica particles doesn't do well with the tubercle bacilli. I like to picture the little red acid fast bacilli hiding in those fibrotic nodules. Remember it how you will, but be aware of the association between silica and tuberculosis. And finally, the asbestos-related complications. Here goes. You need to be aware that lung cancer, also referred to as bronchogenic carcinoma, is the most common neoplastic complication of asbestosis. Got that? Lung cancer is most common, not mesothelioma. There is a clear synergy with tobacco, but even in the non-smoker, lung cancer is still more common. Mesothelioma, on the other hand, has the more characteristic tumor association, but it is considerably more rare. You should be aware that tobacco is not a risk factor for mesothelioma. 
and the latency between asbestos exposure and mesothelioma is lengthy, being in excess of 40 years. Make sure you're familiar with these key and subtle distinctions. You should have familiarity with the pathology of mesothelioma to be reviewed here. The lung cancers have been presented in a separate recording. The first thing to note is there are multiple histopathologic subtypes of mesothelioma, including epithelioid, sarcomatous, or mixed. As such, you are unlikely to see a light microscopy specimen, as there is no one classic appearance. On the other hand, you are much more likely to see an electron microscopy description. You need to be familiar with these two characteristics. On the left, you will see the long curved appearance of the microvilli. On the right, you'll see the image of tonofilaments, which is simply bundles of intermediate protein filaments. Microvilli and tonofilaments are the characteristic pathologic descriptions you can anticipate in a mesothelioma question. All right, so let's summarize. But I want to begin the summary by re-emphasizing these are all interstitial lung disorders sharing the same characteristics of the prototypic idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, including crackles, pulmonary hypertension, widened AA gradient, etc., in addition to the unique characteristics just covered in the previous sections. So let's view the summary slides before going to the sample questions in the next video. Here are the highlights of what we discussed with coal exposure, including anthracosis, fibrosis, and the macrophage role as dust cells while elaborating cytokines. The notes section is important for what is not present in coal workers' lung. No TB, cancer, plaques, or adenopathy. Pretty bland. Here are the highlights for silica with an emphasis on the fibrogenic process and tuberculosis complication. And finally, a summary of the asbestos story, including the types of fibers and their associations with an emphasis on the crocodolite, fiber, and mesothelioma. Although not previously mentioned, somoma bodies may also be found and shouldn't confuse you in a mesothelioma question. So we're going to stop here and in the following video, take on four important sample questions. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, please email me at 12days.